good morning, um, good afternoon, and uh, uh, good evening, of course, depending on where you are in the world. And um, on behalf of myself and uh, the uh, other um, speakers here today, thank you very much for joining us at the uh, launch event for uh, the work we've been doing in uh, person-centered, value-based healthcare. Uh, what we're going to do just for the first couple of minutes, I'll just cover a few uh, technical items, then a quick uh, review of the agenda. Uh, and then after that, uh, I'll very briefly set the scene and then we'll get started uh, with the discussion. So I'm going to just share my screen for this uh, first technical bit, which hopefully you can now uh, see. Uh, as I mentioned briefly at the start, your videos uh, are automatically off and your microphones are automatically muted. I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that with, uh, with webinars, but you should, of course, be able to see us as speakers and panelists, and hopefully you can, you can hear us too. Um, as normal with these types of meetings, we very much encourage you to ask questions and to make comments. Uh, and if you could put those into the chat, uh, they'll be picked up by the panel chairs uh, and fed into the discussion at the appropriate points. Um, we're not going to respond to the chat uh, during the presentations, and that's just so that we can have, all of us can focus on listening to the discussion. Um, but as I say, they will form part of the discussion later on during today's event. Um, any questions that remain unanswered will follow up with the perspective uh, on that after the meeting uh, and the meetings are, are being recorded um, and that's so that uh, people who can't attend today uh, can watch this uh, afterwards. Um, the format, as you um, uh, may have seen, uh, each speaker will give a, a, a high level three minute verbal remark, um, uh, but not going to use slides. Uh, and after we've heard all of the panel speakers, will then open for questions uh, and discussion. Uh, and as I said just a few moments ago, uh, the questions, if you could put those into the chat as, as the uh, conversations uh, unfold. Here's the agenda, which, uh, which you will have seen uh, before. So I'm not going to dwell on this, but just to say, we're going to start off in a moment with the uh, vision and framework uh, and a discussion around that. Uh, then we're going to move into uh, a, a subsequent panel discussion around implementation and recommendations, uh, and then we will end at uh, 10.30 uh, British uh, summer time. In terms of the context, I think we all feel that the, that the discussion today hopefully focuses on what we think is a, a really a fundamental question uh, around how we design, uh, deliver, and measure healthcare, uh, and that is how do we ensure that focus on the uh, individual and what really matters to them as people, uh, while at the same time uh, enabling quality improvement, uh, benchmarking at the level of a, a service or a pathway, while also ensuring uh, the equitable allocation of resource across our uh, populations. And we're very conscious that many of you joining are, uh, have also thought long and hard about these, these topics uh, and are leaders in your own right in this, in this area. And so we hope uh, over the course of today, but also our other launch event on Thursday, uh, that we can contribute to our collective advancement of, of the thinking uh, in, uh, in this area, both through the report and through the discussions that we'll, we'll have. And certainly I think it is our view that person-centered healthcare, value-based healthcare and population equity, there is an opportunity to try and um, uh, support how they uh, come uh, closer together. So just a final thing from me, which is, is uh, some acknowledgements. And, and, and the first is you might have seen in the uh, methodology in the report, we were able uh, to uh, uh, form a community of uh, very uh, senior leaders from across the world uh, to help do this work, uh, many of whom are speaking today and on Thursday. Uh, and I think without that contribution and support, and often at very antisocial times, we certainly wouldn't be discussing this today. So I, I, I want to very much thank everybody, I think on behalf of our, of our, of our group. Um, we also had an industry advisory panel with representatives from a range of pharmaceutical and medical technology companies who also gave input into the community. Uh, and again, I think without that input, we would also be in a, in a poor, 
poorer positions. So our, our, our thanks to, to them as well. And finally, our sponsors who um, gave financial support through grants, uh, but also in kind support, um, including the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands, um, the Institute for Evidence-Based Health at the University of Lisbon in Portugal, uh, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations in um, uh, Brussels, and the Health Standards Organization and Accreditation Canada uh, in Canada. So for our first discussion, I'm going to pass over in uh, a moment to Dr. Sally Lewis. Uh, and Sally is a, is a very close colleague of, of, of mine over many years now. And, uh, and I think many of you will probably know has been absolutely instrumental in establishing uh, and supporting the development of value-based healthcare in Wales in, into what has now become a, 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 a global exemplar for value-based healthcare. Uh, uh, and I think a lot of that we have Sally to thank for. Um, Sally has also been uh, in, in this work, the co-chair of our community of experts. Uh, and so I, it's with the greatest of pleasure that I, um, I hand over to you, Sally. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. And in true 2021 style, I'm uh, chairing this panel from a hotel room with some very loud drilling going on next door. So I hope that doesn't disturb the proceedings too much. Um, so this piece of work um, is a culmination, really, uh, of a lot of thinking and discussion over the last few years. And and was seeking to reconcile some possibly irreconcilable problems in healthcare, where we're spending more and more, doing more and more, but not necessarily always achieving the outcomes that matter to people. So for that reason, we brought together a very, very diverse community of people to think about this, patients, clinicians, um, healthcare organization managers, um, industry uh, partners, regulators, health economists and politicians and, and everyone else in between. And I think it was really important that we did that to get a, as wide a perspective as we possibly could. So this first panel seeks to um, examine uh, the vision of this piece of work and the framework we use to produce it. And it gives me a great pleasure to be joined by three members of our community uh, that were very active in compiling this report over the last year, 18 months. Um, and uh, the first panelist I would like to introduce to you is Kawaldip Semi. Um, Cal Dip's camera has gone off, so I hope he's still there. Cal Dip is the CEO of the International Alliance of Patients Organizations. And uh, can I hand to you, Cal Dip, for your perspectives on the work? Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Sally. I, th I think um, uh, I would firstly start off by saying welcome to everybody. And also thanking you all for having paid uh, good attention to the subject matter we are raising. I know at the moment in the middle of this pandemic, there are lots of forces pulling us and your time is very valuable. You are in the front line and you're serving people and saving lives. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I will start off by saying that uh, post pandemic, uh, uh, the person-centered and value-based healthcare gives us a great new opportunity to explore our health eco healthcare ecosystem afresh. It's this uh, jolt that we needed to look at what we were doing. You know, we were in a rut over 70 years, uh, 75 years with the WHO marking its um, 75th anniversary next year. We also know, I think I've been taught that sometimes things can be a blessing. Uh, they don't seem at that time. So COVID-19 is a blessing in disguise uh, as a failure of our health systems globally legitimizes uh, patient scrutiny into how health systems are governed and financed and operationalized. You know, we were always told that um, doctors knew it all, uh, health policy makers know it all, and that we were in good hands. And I always paraphrase um, um, Frank Kafka's films, uh, the problem with our laws that, yes, uh, if a few elite do know the laws, it helps the general masses to know <laughs> how these are operated. Then again, I think person-centered and value-based healthcare for us gives us a fresh opportunity to examine and reset the balance between the pure financial and clinical drivers of decision-making. I think that's something as dehumanized healthcare, I think for a larger degree. And that decision-making has really pushed things so badly and so uh, forward 
but it has taken us out of the um, societal roots of medicine. And so therefore, this really makes us, uh, it gives us opportunity to bring back that person-centered, patient-centric drivers back into healthcare and look at patient preferences, you know, what is it that, uh, and then we looked at patient preferences. Uh, uh, we have said that they can be determined for many things like studies that we are now currently taking over with IMI uh, prefer we're looking at uh, how patients are reporting their outcomes, per, um, the, the problems and patient reported experience. And together they will give us a much more person-centered or patient-centered healthcare system. Uh, we know what data to collect. We are not only measuring the epidemiology. I think that's the pure driver that's been driving everything. You know, the morbidity and uh, mortality figures. Those are numbers that don't carry any thing around them. This, uh, uh, um, the, this person-centered uh, um, uh, value-based healthcare really gives us those additional uh, context and color. It will really takes healthcare away from a single sketch into a colorful picture. Uh, the world having adopted the Global Patient Safety Action Plan 2021-2030, uh, make sure that person-centered and value-based healthcare uh, gives us that golden opportunity to restructure and institutionalize patient safety, quality, and patient-centric healthcare. We can work to that. And lastly, just to say that um, person-centered uh, person and value-based healthcare has a great impact on equity. I think that's what my main interest is, that it will improve uh, our timely access to innovative medicines and health devices and open up a meaningful uh, uh, door to a meaningful patient engagement and cooperation in the health ecosystem so that we can all enjoy the fruits of this. So I welcome this uh, report and the finding and endorse it fully. Thank you. Thank you, Kaldip. And I'll move straight now to uh, Nicole, Nicole Spreaker. Uh, Nicole is Quality Director and Director East Africa of Farm Access, based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and also in Nairobi, Kenya. Nicole, can I come to you now for your perspectives? Thank you very much, uh, Sally. And, and first of all, uh, very excited to see so many participants from across the world uh, meeting here this, uh, this morning in Amsterdam to talk about this uh, important uh, topic. Um, I think indeed what I'm excited about in this, uh, in this report and a big congratulations to the organizers of, of pulling this together and, and all the participants and giving such valuable input. Uh, but what I really want to congratulate them about is, is the fact that Sub-Saharan Africa and low middle income countries were included in the thinking uh, and the design of this uh, report, which is not necessarily a given. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is the continent with the highest disease burden in the world, and yet it has the lowest healthcare expenditure. And we see nowadays with the COVID pandemic that the situation is even worse and the inequality is just growing uh, rather than uh, narrowing. Um, so as a result of this, health outcomes are the worst uh, on the continent. And yet when it comes to certain uh, diseases or certain conditions such as pregnancy, it's not rocket science. We know what to do, for example, how to reduce maternal mortality and under five mortality, but it's not happening. And we know what to do. We know how to cost it. We know it's feasible on the continent. And yet um, the health outcomes are still uh, very bad. And I think it's because if you're in the Western world, you know, you get pregnant and you're sort of drawn into the system and everything is there to make sure that you go for your ANC visits, that you have support groups and that people care about you and that your healthcare experience is very much patient centric. But in the, on the African continent, once you're outside on the hospital, you're on your own. But an opportunity is here. The mobile phone penetration in uh, Africa is at the moment at almost 90%, which means that most people, including those who are vulnerable and, and very low income groups and even the poor, have a simple feature phone and you're able to reach these patients. If you have a phone, you exist, even though you may not have an address where you live on, where in traditional healthcare approaches, information would be sent to. We've actually taken opportunity from the farm access side to build a value-based healthcare model in Nairobi, Kenya, 
where we've connected women to mobile phones and developed a patient-centric health value-based uh, outcome system where we engage the women through a mobile health wallet to take care of their own pregnancy journey and create loyalty with the uh, doctors to really have a patient-centric maternity journey. And we've seen this work. We've seen that the adherence to, um, to care journeys has increased from a 40% adherence to what is a good care journey to a 75% adherence. So we know that these uh, interactions um, are, are working and that by empowering women also in low and middle income groups, value-based patient-centric health outcomes actually increases um, adherence, increases good health outcomes, and is in fact the basic building blocks on what, um, what universal healthcare coverage should be built on. Um, so I'm very excited that through the report we're advocating and we're, we're pulling examples from throughout the world um, the African continent is moving to which you would, you would see. It's one of the sustainable development goals. And yet when we talk about it, it often seems like start with insurance, start with UHC first, and then value-based healthcare comes next. Like it's the PhD of healthcare. You cannot do it until you graduate from high school first. I'd rather want to advocate for the opposite. That if we think about UHC in Africa and in lower middle income countries, we should think about patient-centric care, reaching the vulnerable and those where you can have high impact in terms of better health outcomes and use innovations that are already on there on the continent um, to drive innovative models that can not only help people in Africa, but can actually leapfrog innovations that can also impact uh, the Western world. I think the time where innovation came from the West and moved to Africa is gone. And actually that is now the reverse and there's a lot of cross-pollination. And I think our report and what we've been talking about and what we'll continue to talk about today is really to see that uh, when we talk about value-based healthcare, it's inclusive for all parts of the world. With that, let me end there. Thank you and uh, Sally, hand over back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Um, really insightful. And, and now, uh, last of our panelists um, on this first panel is John Wilkinson. John has a, an absolutely massive amount of experience in medical devices in particular. Uh, he was elected as chair of the Board of Trustees for the Global Medical Devices Nomenclature in 2019. He's also a visiting expert at the Duke and US Medical School Center for Regulatory Excellence, uh, was previously Director of Devices at the MHRA in the UK. John, over to you. Right, good morning, afternoon and evening, everybody. Um, I want to try and build on um, the, the words of Caldeep and, and, and Nicole. Um, I'm going to start by recognizing the vision of patient cent or person centered value based healthcare, which is to achieve the outcomes that matter to patients and individuals determined by their goals and at the same time uh, manage equitable allocation of resources across populations. I believe that um, regulation. Uh, can contribute to this process. And, uh, and I, so that's where I'm going to come from in this uh, context of this discussion. Regulation comes in two broad categories, really. One is product safety which is, and performance, which is the sort of stuff that regulators like I used to be uh, deal in. But it also uh, is in the area of cost effectiveness and linked reimbursement. So, and people think of regulation covering an array of market access issues. I think in both areas, um, in my experience, patient engagement has been limited and quite difficult and, and probably more so in the, in the safety and performance area than, uh, than the uh, cost effectiveness uh, area. Um, I think things are improving and, and increasingly a focus on human factors is opening the door to regulators getting involved in a, in a broader sense. Building evidence for safety, performance, cost effectiveness is increasingly being integrated in trials for new technologies. Um, and it, it feeds a more holistic view of how 
technologies and uh, can, can be applied to to helping people across the whole of the product life cycle. So I think the world is moving on. Patient input into these processes and outcome measures provides the opportunity to align technology performance measures, which are clinically measurable, with those that are important to patients. Increasingly, things like patient reported outcomes measures are being built into the regulatory and, and monitoring process. Uh, to a lesser extent, patient reported experience measures are being piloted in some areas and developing, but uh, more needs to be done in this space, in my, in my view. Um, perhaps both of these areas need significant investment in methodology development. They are embryonic at the moment. So getting patients involved effectively in the, in the holistic view of performance of, of, of interventions is, is difficult and needs more scope to, to evolve and develop. So how do we align all of this with the goals of individual, individual patients? Well, I think companies manufacturing technologies increasingly will want to demonstrate that their outcomes have a positive impact, not just in the, in the conventional um, uh, outcome measures, but in some of these newer outcomes me measures. It's then really for clinical teams to work with patients so that the technologies are targeted towards the right patient. I think in conclusion, um, people who are developing new interventions and technologies have a very strong interest in them being successful, not surprisingly. Uh, and it's not just financial. It is, it, it, these companies are aiming to serve patients uh, and, and society. And I think developing suites of evidence to support this um, and, and help this adoption process is to the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And um, I, I've got a couple of questions before um, we turn to the questions in the chat. Um, Caldeep and John, evidence-based medicine defined by David Sackett years ago um, was supposed to solve all of these problems, wasn't it? It was supposed to uh, get us having evidence-based guidelines and pathways, evidence-based drugs and devices, uh, based on uh, person-centred preferences. How does this work add to that? And, and what were the limitations of uh, evidence-based medicine? Can I come to Caldip first from, from a patient's perspective on that? Uh, maybe not Caldip, John. <laughs> Okay. Well, no, I think I think the evidence-based push was a very good start from uh, moving from craft medicine, if you like, which was experiential and often individual, um, through to you know introducing more science. But I think the the weakness of most of what's happened historically is it's been the evidence has been built in somewhat limited trials, um, and and clearly there's a shift now from somewhat limited trials through to outcomes um, and measuring outcomes in, in populations that have been on the receiving end of, uh, of intervention. So for me, it's about how do you refine the sophistication of outcomes measurement so that you can actually get a real bearing on whether the intervention was successful or, or not. Because I think the pre-market trial evidence, which is obviously very important, doesn't tell the full story. Thanks, John. Um, and Nicole, um, I was really interested in what you had to say about innovation having changed direction or being a very much a two-way thing between developed countries and, and low and middle income countries and how we were now seeing innovation and potentially leapfrogging because of uh, mobile phone technology and the opportunities that affords for reducing health inequalities. Because we've seen uh, COVID expand the gap in, in health inequalities everywhere in the world, haven't we? To, to what extent do you think um, developed countries can benefit from the sort of approaches you, you're witnessing in sub-Saharan Africa? 
-hmm. Thanks so much, uh, Sally. And um, in, indeed, you see the in inequality rising at the moment. I think we're sitting on a billion uh, vaccines in the Western uh, world that, that could vaccinate half of Africa and where we're not willing to share, right? So I, I, I think it's a devastating situation that, that needs to change um, urgently. Um, I think one of the challenges that you have in the Western world is that so many systems are already there uh, and implemented that it cannot always be easy to change it. Um, through mobile phone technology, um, with people being connected, value-based healthcare doesn't mean that you need to have a very complicated system or very complicated equipment. I think value, um, as John also alluded to, is, is targeting your money where your biggest impact uh, is. And that is even more important in a continent where the amount of money is, is very limited. And you have to make tough choices because you cannot simply treat, um, treat everyone uh, as much as you'd want to because of the, the limitations of the available financing in the, in the world. Now, what we've developed through mobile phone technology is a way of connecting people and, first of all, identifying who they are, but also with an intake uh, form, identifying very basic uh, preconditions. The way you would treat a, a, a pregnant lady that is a teenager uh, living with HIV AIDS is very different from, uh, from somebody who is maybe in a, in a more uh, stable uh, healthy background uh, and, and is having a child by uh, choice rather than by, by chance. So being able to design care journeys uh, specifically to, uh, to target the social economic background as well as the disease profile or precondition background of the women that you can identify through a very simple questionnaire, have an algorithm in the back that then allocates um, additional financing knowing that these vulnerable patients will need some additional care that needs to be covered for at um, the healthcare facility, or maybe a woman needs to be referred um, at the moment uh, some complications arise. This is not rocket science. It's about putting the money and the value in the hands of the patient. Now, traditionally in Africa, um, there was very much what we call a supply-driven system. It means that the, the medication and the staffing is allocated to the healthcare facilities and whether they were treating patients or not doing that much, it didn't make a difference. Now, if you put the value of a good care journey or a COVID vaccine or something else in the hands of the individual who can then open this entitlement at a healthcare facility and access it so that payment is only being done when actual treatment is being given, according to actual quality standards at a real healthcare facility, you already see, and we've, we've evidence for that, you see a turnaround where the value of the care process becomes much more important um, and not the treatment process or uh, just the supply process and making medication available. Now, I think in, in Europe, we don't pay with mobile phones. We're still very traditional where we have uh, a bank account or where we have a a fully functional uh, insurance institution. But I think there's a real opportunity to leapfrog this um, and, and, and use mobile technology where you don't need heavy institutes the way we've built in the Western world because we built them in the 1950s when the world was very different, but have a lot of these entitlements check and empowering the individual so that they can go to a healthcare facility and, and access those services. And I think this is something that is true everywhere in the world. We're dealing, I'm from the Netherlands myself, you cannot open the newspaper without seeing a discussion about care and how we allocate it and how we can still afford it. And I think if we have simple, sim similar solutions where as an individual, you have an entitlement on your care process that is much more directed to your own personal needs and profile and that might change in the course of a lifetime, I think we start rethinking how um, healthcare is, is being done and ultimately also make it much more affordable so that we can continue to have comprehensive healthcare also in the future. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, the question's coming through thick and fast now. So just to reassure you, any questions you put in the chat that we don't answer now, we will endeavor to answer in writing um, after the launch. Um, 
The next question I'd like to pose, John and Caldip, perhaps Caldip first, is how do we enhance the patient's role in HTA, in health technology assessment? I think this is very important from, we are conducting at IAPA, we are conducting three studies now, one in, the, in Africa, uh, one in uh, Asia Pacific and one in Latin America. Uh, looking at the HTA process and how patients are uh, engaged in that. Uh, as you see, um, many health systems, I think, uh, were left to health economists and uh, to treasuries, especially, you know, some of the decision making there. And since the HTA has come about, um, they have realized that the HTA isn't about economic assessment, it is much wider societal assessment. Uh, what, how do we value? Uh, certain aspects and uh, certain new uh, technologies. And that means that patients do need to come in. I think uh, with the finishing of uh, some of the post-pandemic lessons that we are learning now, it is absolutely clear that we there, there's no room for us to go into there and to create a better uh, investment procedure within the health technology assessment uh, process, bring up our viewpoints of our more experts. We are trying to build up the training and capacity building for them. So we'll be running three different HTA training programs as well. So that's one of the things. We'll be working with a wide variety of groups. Uh, for instance, NICE UK, uh, the International Decision Sport uh, Institute. We'll be also extending it to H, uh, HITAP uh, in Thailand, and then going even further to C CDE in Taiwan to help us out. So those are the things. So firstly, build up the interest as to show them why it's important for them to be there. You know, If you need equitable and early access to innovation, you gotta be there. And second is to drive that uh, capacity, that uh, uh, confidence and motivation uh, to be able to participate in that. And we need to tell them that even the health systems don't understand that. Even some of the best uh, organized systems are running HTA still as if it's an economic analysis. And it's nothing more than that. It's actually a much wider analysis and it requires much of this. And lastly, uh, I am also part of the IMI prefer. We are actually engaging patients to uh, bring in more patient preferences and instruments that can give us specific uh, utility numbers and figures we need for particular cases. At the moment, many of the HTA analysis uh, is being done by using generalized uh, utility data that is being then uh, shoehorned into uh, square peg run hole, all sorts of things. So we're trying to bring that in as well, uh, more research and development than that. Thank you. Thank you, Cardiff. And, and John, I'd like to pose you the same question, but, but with a twist, if I may, um, because Charles House uh, has asked us to expand a little bit on the tension between catering for the individual's needs and wants and, and uh, also getting equity in the population, which, of course, is highly relevant to patient involvement in HTA. Could you draw a little bit of that into your answer as well? Well, perhaps I'll kick off there. I mean, I, th I when I first got involved in this project, it was very clear to me that the, there was a potentially huge gulf between the two. Uh, if you look at value-based healthcare and its fundamentals, it is a sort of mechanistic, economic um, approach to allocating resources in the healthcare system, and and initially paid little heed to. Um, uh, patients or patient values. It really was about getting the best bang for your dollar spend or pound spend or euro spend or whatever currency you like. Um, and I think that um, the perception has always been that person-centered or patient-centered healthcare is a license for people to, you know, sort of spend money willy-nilly on things which aren't necessarily evidence-based. And, you know, it leads to uh, spending getting out of control. Um, and I think the, the discussions we've had as a group suggest that those aren't irreconcilable issues. They're very much reconcilable issues because if you want good outcomes, you have to engage patients in the process if you, uh, because they're a big part of the, uh, the effectiveness of uh, any intervention, the attitude, the performance, the, the, uh, you know, the whole 
patient and, and person related package is going to have a significant impact on on outcomes but equally you can't just um, uh, look at that perspective alone you have to think about being equitable in allocating resources across society so i think that's the sort of my spin on the whole thing um, getting patients involved i think people in industry and, and regulators have found very difficult and i think there are a number of and i think this is where patient organizations can help substantially because uh, it, you need to get a an objective patient input and often patients are highly motivated by their own individual situations which is reasonable but can um, potentially skew the situation so i think most organizations are very uncomfortable um, in, in or haven't got well established processes for getting patients involved and the right sort of patient input, if you like, which represents the population as a whole. I can speak with some experience on this, having been on NICE committees, which are full of eminent um, clinic, clinic voices who have uh, professors before their names and a list of uh, letters after their names, which disappears into the sunset. You need to be very confident to put your hand up and say, actually, I don't agree with this. So I, I feel it, if you like, for the patient engagement in the process. It is hard, you know, you're up against some very expert yeah. and intimidating situations. Well, so, Sally, could I just take on from uh, John, what John Please said? Do. I think yeah. uh, one of the things that we are discovering is that uh, your ordinary patient, uh, say, when I say ordinary, there is no such thing as that, but your standard patient, is deeply concerned with the immediate survival rates, uh, his or her treatment, especially in cancer. So therefore, uh, very few of them have got uh, any latitude in their personal lives, emotional makeup to do anything but then focus on themselves. But then there are others who have got that time. So we're looking at those. Secondly, I think what John has said is, within the NICE committees, I've seen there's some um, so-called professors who are patients themselves. So those are the ones we are really looking for. These are the insiders who can really bring in, uh, the, who stand, stand up and said, uh, look beyond my title as a patient. I'm a uh, PhD in almost a Nobel Prize winner in economics and yeah, I need to be looked at seriously. So those are the people we have got. Then again, we are forming a relationship with your party. So I'm very thankful to your party for having now extended its program globally and they're forming relationships. We are in, uh, for instance, our members in India, uh, in Japan have done that. Now it's been a subject. We are taking that model forward. That uh, bulk and breadth of confidence that your party gave to European patients to engage in, um, uh, not only at EMA and their own regulatory agencies uh, and HDA bodies, but also globally. And not forgetting HDAI, uh, who I think are uh, like driving the flag forward. I think I really love them what they've done for us and uh, so STAI and uh, looking at uh, your party is very good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Kaldit. Nicole, brief comment from you and then I'll, I'll um, conclude this part of the session. Thanks, yeah, I just wanted to add on, on John's uh, comment how difficult it is to engage patients, not only the right patients, but also getting the information out um, from, from our own work. Uh, we've, we've actually used the iChilm uh, standard set to, to, to measure patient reported health outcomes in the, in the slums of Nairobi. And one of the things we looked at is, is depression, uh, which is actually a huge uh, and, and under-recognized issue in, uh, in developing countries. And we asked these women if they had signs of, of, of depression. And the answer we got back is, I live in the, you know, I live in the slums of Nairobi. I have no money. The husband is not there. And I have, you know, my fourth child just now that I don't know how I'm going to pay for. What do you think? I'm, of course, I'm depressed. And it was, it was such, a, you know, it, it was such an important moment where you realize that it, it matters, the outcome measures matter. You need to do something about it but that you also need to contextualize and realize that within a social economic uh, background, more aspects are playing than, than just the disease itself. And I think those are the aspects that we need to take care of. There's issues that you can solve. Actually, we, we helped, for example, these women with ambulance services so that when they delivered, they didn't have to go at the middle of the night in a dangerous area like the slum. 
and could still safely reach um, the healthcare facility. That doesn't mean that you can change the whole situation, but that sometimes the solutions are actually quite simple to bring some sense of security, safety, and better health outcomes into these care packages. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you very much indeed uh, for the contribution of our panelists today. Uh, I want to close off this session <clears throat> by um, uh, addressing a question from Oscar, which is really, really important. Why bother bringing person-centered healthcare and value-based healthcare together? Does that not just complicate the, um, the delivery of value-based healthcare indeed around the world. And I want to pose that question back to Tom because that is absolutely fundamental to how this work started in the first place, if you remember, Tom. Uh, and I thought you might like to answer that before we moved on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Sally. And actually, I had also noted this point because I think the, the it is a Venn diagram, actually, a lot of this, which, which Frank, actually, Sally made and is in the report. And I think there clearly are aspects of value-based healthcare that are person-centered, uh, and there are clearly aspects to both of these things that look at the importance of population level equity from a resource allocation perspective. But if we're thinking about the overall design of a healthcare system, um, it is uh, value-based healthcare by itself is not strictly person-centered as, as far as person-centered healthcare goes, but person-centered healthcare uh, can also benefit substantially from value-based healthcare. And the, the thought there is that it is entirely possible if you have, a, if we're standardizing outcomes, and indeed if we're paying based on those outcomes, that we start to incentivize healthcare systems to actually achieve what doesn't matter to individuals. Uh, a, a simple example of that is uh, a, a advanced uh, cancer of some form. Uh, in one person, there might be a preference for survival. In another person, there might be a preference for quality of life over survival. Uh, and if we're incentivizing survival uh, 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 through our payment mechanism, uh, there is a risk that we don't understand what matters most to that individual, and by so doing, destroy value rather than enhance value. And so this clearly is complicated, and it's clear that we can't do everything that everybody wants. But we felt, I think, and, and tried to reflect this in the report, that there is no limit to the goals and aspirations that we can understand. What we then have to do, which is what John was talking about, is then with the decisions we've taken around the allocation of resource at the population level, we have to figure out how they can then be effectively used at the uh, uh, pathway and individual level to support the achievement of the goals that matter. And the final thing to say and, and, and is, is it would also seem very important, and what Nicole was saying about pregnancy and childbirth and the, and the IGON standard set, that how we can link together and the, the goals that people have with the outcomes that we can, the, with standardized metrics that we capture, as well as the process and structures, which I saw was also a question in the in the chat. Uh, Sally, I hope I, I hope that also resonates with with uh, with you. Yeah, I, I thought it was important to to start to address that, and I think we'll hear a lot more about that and unpick that further in the second panel and again on Thursday, of course. Uh, so thanks again to to the first panel and um, back to Tom uh, to take us on to the next part of the agenda. Thank you very much, Sally, and um, yeah, thanks thanks to everyone and thanks for the comments in the chat. So we'll move swiftly on, and, and this one, as Sally said, should start to get into some of the issues that we've just started to raise, um, and uh, it's going to take a look at implementation and, and the recommendations that we've developed. I'm going to start by just giving a brief introduction to each panel member, uh, and then I'll hand straight over to uh, Professor Christabel Saunders. Um, so first of all, an introduction to um, Christabel. Um, Christabel has been, a, 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 since 2002, a professor of uh, surgical oncology at the University of Western Australia in Perth, with a particular focus on breast cancer uh, and melanoma. Um, and, and later this, uh, this uh, calendar year, she'll take up the, the very uh, prestigious position uh, of the uh, James Stewart Chair uh, of Surgery at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the University of Melbourne. Uh, uh, of course, both in, in Australia. So we'll hear from Christabel, then we'll move on to Tony. Um, and Tony's currently a senior expert at the World Health Organization's Uni uh, European Centre for Primary uh, Healthcare. Um, and Tony's also had a very wide range of leadership roles 
uh, uh, over a number of years, including the CEO of the uh, Global and Local Network for Integrated and Personalized Care, uh, the CEO of the International Foundation for Integrated Care, uh, and also the director uh, of the Agency for Health Quality and Assessment of Catalonia. We'll then move from Tony to Martha um, Kidana Marion, and, and, and Martha is a PhD student at the moment at the Department of Biomedical uh, Data Sciences and Medical Decision Making within the Leiden University Medical Center, uh, and she's also a junior a junior doctor uh, in in the Netherlands, um, uh, and she will return to her clinical practice after after her PhD. Uh, and then finally, Thomas, Thomas Alvin. Um, Thomas is the Executive Director for Strategy and Healthcare Systems at uh, EFPIA, uh, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries uh, and uh, Associations. And he has a particular responsibility for policies around patient-centeredness, value-based healthcare outcomes measurement and uh, sustainability. So that's, that's uh, our plan and I'll um, hand straight over to, um, to Christopher, thanks. Thanks very much, Tom. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm actually speaking um, from the lands of the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and I'd like to uh, pay my respects to traditional owners, past and present, both here and indeed everywhere around the world. So I've been asked to think a little bit from a health, uh, health system perspective about this idea of person-centered value-based healthcare. And it really is, it is a bit, as Thomas said, it's a bit of a dichotomy when you think about it, because our health systems may well be looking at trying to bring in value-based healthcare, but that's often very hard to reconcile with actually looking at the individual different needs that the patients may have and the outcomes that matter to them. And that truly individualized care is often really hard to put into that. I mean, we're very good at measuring outputs, aren't we? But we're not very good at measuring outcomes, particularly patient reported outcomes or patient reported experience measures. Um, but I do believe that if we can try and develop this, we'll actually probably not only get a better health system, but I think a more efficient health system. I mean, it's really the idea of looking at choosing wisely on a big scale and choosing wisely on a small individual scale as well. And the first step, I think, in doing this sounds so simple, but that is really to change our whole way of thinking to putting the patient at the center of everything we do. And you think as a clinician, that's how we always think. And yet, just as a small example today, I was in a meeting where we're trying to develop a new uh, clinic service for surveillance of people at high risk of solid malignancies with inherited syndromes. And the first thing everybody started talking about was how difficult it was to you know, get more, more, more resources for whole body MRI, how difficult it was to find the resources, the clinic space. And yet, when we realigned our thinking and thought how important it was for these patients, and how we may well be able to prevent them presenting with advanced diseases later on, which will take up much more time and energy for us in terms of imaging or looking after them, it started to make real sense. So what do we actually do practically? I'm, I'm a surgeon, I'm quite practical. So I was thinking, what do we do practically to try to put this into practice? And I think the first step is really putting patients in there when we're thinking of any planning decisions. And it was great to hear some of the ideas around that earlier. To really ensure that all health service providers really understand and practice the art of shared decision-making, which is an educational thing we need to do. Often our patient journeys are across not just one healthcare provider, particularly somewhere like Australia, where we have a, a mixed private and public system. Patients may have their journey spread across the, pr the primary healthcare system, secondary and tertiary care, and many healthcare providers. So looking at how we can get that pathway of care bundled together and measure the outcomes that matter to patients along that pathway, as well as how much it costs to deliver those. And when we're talking about those measures, as I say, thinking seriously, not only about clinical outcomes, but PROMs and PREMs. And I was delighted to hear Nicole mention the use of the ICHOM data sets to do that. And then, of course, enabling that with good IT solutions. Now, for all of us, there will be different solutions. There will be different solutions for different patient groups, for different disease groups and across jurisdictions. But I think we can all learn from each other and look at examples of how we've done that together. And, and I work with an organization called AllCAM, which is looking at improving efficiencies in cancer care. And that very much is an international effort where we can look at examples from other jurisdictions and other disease processes within cancer. And I think that's really important for us to do. And I'd like to think this is a great step 
in us beginning to learn how to do that together. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much, Christopher. Thanks. Um, Tony. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Tom, and thank you, Sally, because it, it's really, really an honor um, to have been invited to participate in these initiatives. Um, and so I'm going to focus a little bit on, on the global perspective. And uh, as the cost of the healthcare continues to rise uh, inexorably around the world, we seek assurance that investment in health is meeting the needs of people equitably. So um, as said in the report, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, OECD, predicted in November 2019 that over the, I think is the, uh, the next 15 years, health spending would increase by more than GDP growth in most OECD countries, averaging an annual growth rate of 2.7%. So this is a quite a figure. And this was a report in 2019. Imagine now what happens after COVID. So yet, despite rising expenditure, uh, there is limited understanding around the extent of which money we invest in health and well-being as well, and, and what matters to people. This is something that we've been talking about uh, uh, with my, my uh, colleagues here. So the person-centered value-based healthcare, and I like, Tom, that you emphasize bringing those together, person-centered and value-based healthcare. So the framework, this framework that we've uh, reported, encourages comparison of the value achieved between peers in the same but at the same time in the different healthcare systems. And this is an excellent tool. So, and with the aim of what? So I think we should take advantage of the aim of learning and knowledge translation that all with the goal of improving value. And this is the ultimate goal that we should achieve. So, so at the macro level, you'll see that in the report, we propose to use aggregated MISO uh, level data to give a view of the entire system level performance. But this can be scaled up to even to supranational levels. So this is the advantage to be able to compare and the gaps there are. So if we accept that resources are uh, finite, um, then what we, uh, we have to accept is that choices will have to be made about where and how those resources are deployed. And this reinforces the need to focus on, uh, on high value activity as well. So this is another element that I, I want to, uh, to bring here in this, uh, in this equation. So there is much to be done to reduce low value care and release resources to improve care elsewhere in the care pathway. So there are examples worldwide of many initiatives which support in part or in whole the principles that underpin value-based healthcare. I can think uh, of a, a few of them. Uh, for example, uh, Cristobal uh, mentioned choosing wisely and uh, there is too much medicine, prudent uh, healthcare, realistic medicine. And I was uh, leading a project in Catalonia, uh, in Spain, uh, fully implemented is about essential, uh, essential. This is the name of the project. And all those are um, referenced in the report if you want to, to explore more. So that, that's uh, very good uh, to, to search. So uh, I would like to raise one question here. And, and this, is the, the, this session is about what are the implications for implementation? Implementing person-centered value-based uh, healthcare requires some core conditions in creating a system that's person-centered value-based care. So, and this uh, can include, and ju I'm just going to, to, to mention a few, a number of commitments. So one of them as uh, core highlighted is the meaningful involvement of people. And I would like to insist on that. It's not just a micro level, missile level, macro level, but at the same time, even in supranational organizations, we th should think about the involvement of people. Equity is being mentioned as well. So between different population groups and in the context of these limited resources. And I would like to pay attention to equity. I think this is important. All healthcare systems have limited resources for sure. It is not possible to achieve everyone's goal 
and to follow everyone's preference. And this is something that is the core essence of, the, of, of this initiative. Um, so therefore, at, at the macro level, uh, and healthcare systems need to decide how much money they are going to invest, whether in particular health conditions or in particular organizations or in their health system. And then the outcomes they expect for such investments. So according to the principles of the person-centered value-based uh, value healthcare that uh, as you could see here, my colleagues have been sharing with you, um, we are aiming to achieve the outcomes, the processes and the structures that matter most to individuals. So individuals should be part on this important equation. So depending on the system at the MISO or the macro levels, leaders, and I'm putting the word leaders here, need to decide in which products and services they will invest to make this happen. And another commitment that I like that many of, of, of um, the speakers have, have, have mentioned um, is, con is education. And continuous education is a key element for uh, uh, enabling primary uh, um, present-centered value-based health uh, in the systems. So, but what are these enablers? So, as I said, system leaders need to consider the change in approach that could be required so that the person-centered value-based healthcare can be achieved. So once one on one way is the system leaders. And another one is that I think we should align. Uh, so the strategy for the systems must be underpinned on a clear vision and the framework that takes into account the person-centered value-based healthcare. So, and as said, I think uh, many of you you've mentioned, and I think uh, uh, um, it was um, quite well discussed, technology was is, is, is one of the enablers. So, and another question could be um, uh, how to get started with this uh, person-centered value-based healthcare and the e impact uh, at the whole system level. So we Tony. also need, yes, is I'm about to finish. Yes, you are perfect. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. Yes, I'm just going to give a few recommendations here and that's it. So what we also need to collect is evidence that this is working. So we recommend, uh, for example, that the healthcare systems always need to embrace digital knowledge. We need to engage uh, the, the, the leaders. And as Nicole said, and this is something that it's, it's, it's very important here, all aspects of this report apply to low and middle, middle income countries as well. And we, they should incorporate, and there is an opportunity to incorporate the uh, primary uh, uh, present-centered value-based healthcare in their strategic plans. So, and, and this is very aligned and, and then spinch with the, uh, uh, with the Doria Joe perspective regarding the healthcare workforce. Uh, I insist on uh, a curriculum for continuous professional development. And in the same time, at the same time, the curriculum at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels, this should include this perspective. And, 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 and this is, I'm, I'm just concluding with this. So we'll leave a space for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. thanks very much. Martha. Yes, thank you so much. So um, I would like to start off um, by describing my personal experience. Even though I'm currently working as a researcher, I think my perspective on person-centered value-based healthcare is mainly shaped by my experience as a healthcare professional. So today I would like to um, talk about three things. Um, one, challenges as a healthcare professional, to how those how person-centered value-based healthcare relates to these challenges and what I believe to be the essence of person-centered value-based healthcare. So if we talk about challenges, of course, uh, we are middle in, in the pandemic, so healthcare professionals are working under a great amount of pressure, but also prior to the pandemic, uh, multiple challenges were quite visible. Uh, shortage of staff, a high administrative burden, an increase in complexity of cases in an aging population, often with comorbidity, in those cases, stated care is vital, but making a care plan that fits becomes even more challenging if patients are not supported or even invited to set their own goals and talk about their preferences. And what I personally found challenging was that there was a limited time to spend with patients. Uh, for example, a study in the Netherlands showed that residents at the internal medicine department only spent 13% of their day with patients. Um, and in that study, a large amount of their time went to administrative tasks. Um, and this is partly due to excessive metrics. 
And even though a lot is being measured um, and efficiency is being improved, healthcare costs are still rising at an unsustainable rate, um, which is also mentioned by Tony. And the number of initiatives developed to solve these issues can sometimes be quite overwhelming as a healthcare professional and seems to be fragmented. Um, and sometimes even feel a quite detached from real life medicine. Um, and I hope that person centered value based healthcare could function as a vehicle for initiatives that already are working at the cross section of person centered value based healthcare, um, from person centered healthcare and value based healthcare, which is increasingly the case. For example, in the Netherlands, a lot of focus is on using outcome data for shared decision making, which I think is a good example of already value based healthcare principles and person centered principles are coming together. And in person centered healthcare, a standardized data measurement is linked to goals of people receiving care. And those goals are not only applicable to outcomes, but also to processes, because in real life, sometimes patients might prefer a less burdensome process, and that could be equally important to achieve a certain outcome. So if you also talk about processes, um, I think we can all agree that everybody uh, wants to have a respectful communication with their clinician, uh, that they want to have shown empathy. Um, so we also have to bring in uh, the patient reported experience measurements. And it would not only be uh, something we measure, but also something that would be a core condition in person-centered value-based healthcare. And overall, linking goals to standardized metrics hopefully would lead to a reduction of excessive collection of data that does not reflect what matters to patients. Um, and that way, hopefully also reduce the administrative burden on clinicians. And moreover, what I think is important in person-centered value-based healthcare is the role of data that shifts from criticizing performance to assessing to what extent we are achieving goals of patients. And this meaningful data could also be used as input at all healthcare levels. So in, into conversations with patients, but also into care design, quality improvement, and policy development. This requires a culture open to learning, prioritizing patients, and perhaps changes in system design. Uh, such as lengthier consultations. Um, and lastly, what I believe is most clinicians enter the profession because of their intrinsic motivation to care for patients. Um, and I think person-centered value-based healthcare is rooted in real-life medicine because its essence is prioritizing patients and working together with patients to, to add value to their lives and understanding their context and preferences and goals. And I would like to close off with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Martha. And then finally, Thomas, and I just encourage you, if you've got any further questions, just if you put those now into the chat and we'll uh, make sure they're captured for the discussion. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. And and uh, first, just to say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and excited to be here at this launch event. And uh, I think it's been a great great to work on this report uh, during the previous year and 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 really hope to see how we can move forward with the with the implementation because i think and this is what we're going to to talk about uh, now here in this and that we're talking about in this in this panel so i'm just going to make a few brief remarks on the implementation part coming sort of from a life science industry uh, perspective and and first of all i mean i think i think it's uh, hugely important to that, uh, that which is the purpose of, of the report to bring together the perspectives of value-based healthcare and person-centered healthcare. And I think that will also force us to think more uh, clearly about how we define value-based healthcare and person-centered healthcare, which is not all, uh, also not always that, uh, that clear. But I think that for the life science industry and including the, uh, the pharma industry, uh, sort of implementing a person-centered and value-based approach really begins at the beginning in research and development. So it's it's not something you can throw in at the end. It's something that has to be integrated throughout the entire uh, development cycle of a new product or a new or a new service. And 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 this is clearly something that the industry is doing more and more. And and just speaking uh, when it comes to 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 the farm industry in Europe, so represented by 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 FBA, uh, back in 2017, we, we published this paper working together with patient organizations, which was developed together with patient organizations in Europe on how to have meaningful patient engagement throughout the life cycle uh, of, of, uh, of a medicine. And, and, um, and the several FBA companies have also been in, involved in the paradigm project through the Innovative Medicines Initiative to develop a toolbox 
on patient engagement. So uh, this is really a strategic agenda for the industry. And, and I think also the data shows that, for instance, in, in HGA submissions, that uh, patient reported outcomes are, are, are increasing uh, in percentage of all uh, submissions. So, so, so it is working. And, and, uh, uh, but I think also, and this has been said uh, also in the previous panel, that, that of course it's, it's, it's very important that the system is aligned so that also the HGA agencies and the payers are looking at these patient relevant outcomes or patient satisfaction. And, and uh, uh, so that you get the signals all across the system, because if, if these endpoints or, or patient satisfaction is not valued by HGA agencies or by payers, then the signal back to the industry is that you shouldn't invest in these things uh, because they are not they are not valued uh, by us and 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 especially for an industry that operates in a sort of a ten year time frame in terms of research and, and development uh, this is very important um, and 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 then of course just just so so patient involvement in in HGA uh, and all this is 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 hugely important just finally very quickly because the paper also mentioned. Payment models, uh, and this is of course also something that that companies are engaging with payers to sort of tie payments to the actual outcomes achieved. And I think here more collaboration is needed uh, to kind of facilitate these models, overcome the hurdles that can be legal, technical. A lot is about data collection uh, that that we all know, and I think that's a red line through all the speakers that we need to collect the right the right data, and 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 also think of how do we balance collecting the ultimate data on, on patient outcomes versus what's feasible in the given uh, situation. And I think to be fair, many times we're actually using some sort of proxy outcomes uh, for, for measuring outcomes. And where do we strike that balance? And we really need a dialogue to solve this. And, and, and I think that's, uh, that's really the, the, the kind of final point here that, that implementing person-centered and value-based healthcare requires much closer collaboration between all stakeholders in, in health systems, because we need to align on what is it we want to achieve and how do we set up the systems, including data collections, to, to achieve that. And, and, and the industry is clearly uh, on board uh, on that journey. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks very much. So uh, let's get started with this, with one question that's, that's coming up here in the, in the chat around uh, the change and the particular issue about length of consultations and is it is it realistic to to expect us to be able to do that around goal setting shared decision making and, and potentially the more time that's involved and the added point here which is where um marlene says uh, is it really about time or is it actually about depth and are the two the same does one go did they both go together or are they different and i think if we start with uh, if you don't mind, uh, Martha and Christabel, uh, and then we, we see where we get from there. But maybe, Christabel, we go to you first and then over to you, uh, Martha, if that's OK. Yeah, well, what Martha said resonated. We do spend far too much time um, looking at those outputs, don't we, and trying to collect things and, and do a lot of administrative tasks, which if we could streamline, and we should be able to now with our great IT solutions, it would free up more time. But I also think that question of depth and the sort of, the sort of conversations we're having with patients, if we did already have pre-warned when the patient comes, a good idea of what their particular concerns were, in other words, we prospectively collect PREMs and PROMs, if we know what the goals that they want of their treatment are, we can target those conversations with patients much better. Um, and we know, we know that spending a little bit of time listening and, and putting effort up front will translate into a much better um, use of our time, if you like, later on down the track. So I think it's trying to realign ourselves to think that way. Um, and traditionally, I don't, I, we, we could spend a lot of time with patients. Patients are often in hospital for prolonged periods. That doesn't happen anymore. Virtually all care is, is ambulatory care now. Patients who are in hospital are often extremely sick. Um, and so we need to realign how we do things in the ambulatory setting to be able to effectively and efficiently capture that data. And using good IT solutions um, is a great way of doing that. So for example, if we can 
uh, ensure that patients are able to answer those questions on their mobile phone devices or on their other mobile devices before they come and they're triggered by certain changes in the patient's condition. So we're alerted to those in time. It's a great way of more efficiently using our time. That's fantastic as well. Thank you. Mark, Mark. Yeah, so I also agree with uh, Christabel. I think the data could also inform us to uh, allow us to have a more structured consultation because we already know beforehand if if a patient, for example, has certain symptoms or not. That could also make a decision if we are going to see the patient three monthly or yearly. So that could entirely change the structure of how we see patients at the outpatient clinic, for example. Um, and also, if the patient comes, we could very easily get the consultation structured um, based on the input from the patient. And also, I would say um, sometimes for it could be that we need lengthier consultations and it requires an investment, um, a financial investment perhaps, and that's not, not my area of expertise, but I would say that if we truly want to engage patients that could require an investment um, also in time, but I agree with Marlene, it's not only length of time, but also depth. And I hope data could help us in depth um, and then we could see how much that uh, takes up in time. See, Christabel yeah. wants to add. Could I just add one thing in? I, I mean, I'm sure all of us have experienced this, either with ourselves or our neighbours or our family members. Navigating the health system is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And a lot of a lot of people have been mentioning about the burden on patients of doing this. But actually, the real burden on patients is working out where they're supposed to go. Are oh, they supposed to have had these scans by then? What actually is happening next in the healthcare journey? And that navigating the healthcare journey at the moment is really hard for a lot of people. And trying to to ensure that people really understand what that healthcare journey is and we help them along that journey and, and some of the examples that we heard earlier from Africa about navigating that journey um, having clear pathways that are delivered to patients with online or, or, or mobile app solutions is a great way of being able to do that and I'm sure we could use that to a lot better effect and patients would be delighted to know where they're going next and who they should ask when they have a question. Thanks, Chris, but thanks very much. And it would be interesting to know, Michael and uh, others who, uh, Marlene, uh, Nico here, who put these questions in the chat, if, if, you're, if this is resonating with you, uh, what you just heard from uh, Martha and, um, and Christabel. Um, it, Christabel started to pick up on the point here that uh, about patient engagement and it being, um, it can be quite an all-consuming task. And we've just heard the perspective there from Christabel about what actually is is, is extremely time consuming. And I'm just actually trying to look to relocate the question, which I've now, here we go. So the question was also from Molly uh, about uh, increasing the work of being uh, a patient. And I just wondered from anyone, um, Tony, Thomas, Christopher, Martha, any further perspective on that, uh, uh, that concern? I mean, maybe maybe I can just uh, uh, jump jump in here. Uh, I mean, I think I think it, it's it's uh, fully understand that concern, and I think that it's clear that uh, when it comes to patient engagement, and and of course, uh, pharmaceutical companies and and FBR also working, you know, with an uh, public private partnership such as IMI often you know try to connect with the patient organizations that that are there to do this patient engagement and and but the patient organizations are are usually not that well resourced and of course many of the patient experts that are, that, that 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 they are using are are not not necessarily uh, remunerated for for their time and services and that becomes uh, an issue so so i think but but this is a political issue in the end, and I and I think that if if policymakers are serious about having uh, people and patient centered health systems, they need to ensure that that the patient organisations or or whoever is representing the patients have the resources that uh, that they need to be able to do this and and engage with you know both the industry decision makers regulators uh, because otherwise otherwise the, the 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 system will not work and and here i think there's an opportunity with with you know at least look, ho looking at europe uh, with all the new sort of funds being set up uh, by the european commission 
on on strengthening health systems, uh, etc. I think I think there's an there's an opportunity here for for a change. Thank you, Dr. Uh, yes, um, I've seen in the chat that there are many many things uh, around the the, the how um, people uh, navigate in, within the system, the whole system, and and as as Christopher said, uh, there are many people that uh, they can get lost. So, and this in in a way is, is reflects the experience of the, the 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 individuals, the persons within the systems. So, one 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 of the things that could be relevant is and and the added value of the uh, of this the, the the report and what it brings here is that there is the need sometimes to redesign design the health system, putting the, 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 the person in the center and thinking about the, the, the routes and the care pathways they have to follow for not getting lost. And then there are many discussions here on, on, on the table. Uh, do we need a, 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 a case manager? Do we need a navigator? Or who, who has to do this role? So, and this is something to do for the future is shifting roles and the papers that uh, the, the, the workforce and the, the, the healthcare professionals are doing, you know? And, and somebody would say, um, I cannot delegate in a shared decision-making from a doctor to a nurse, but I think this is the next step. And from the WHO perspective, thinking that the system is composed about many actors, not just the, the doctors is the the whole collective of uh, professionals that work they are working in the health system in addition the patient being part of the person being part of the, of this 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 decision making process this is relevant and then listening to the evidence and and this is where uh, i like when when thomas started uh, talking about that um uh, the process of, of a person centered value based healthcare starts in the research that happens in the labs so this is true because otherwise there will, there wouldn't be choice of that so taking into account the information the important information that's gathered at that level and developed at the at the at the at the, at the labs this is very important as well so Thank you, Tony. Okay, so I, maybe just one, I've been trying to monitor the chat here as we've been going through, and I think there's one question that perhaps is different to the, the theme that's going through here, uh, and that's from Eve, um, around within a PCBBHC system, should a patient be allowed to co-pay for what is specifically valued by her or him? Um, and do you mind if we start with you, Chris, uh, with Chris Val, and that, Tony, is your hand up for, for this one as well? Oh, no, no, it's not. Okay. If we start with Chris Val, then maybe we go to you, Thomas, and then we see what the time is. I don't think I'm an expert on this, Thomas, but um, it's been interesting for me, having grown up in the national health system in the UK and then moving to a system in Australia 20 odd years ago where a lot of people do pay for what they want in the health system. The problem is that, that most people, when they enter with the disease, are not experts on that disease and they don't really know what they're paying for and what the excellence of services are. And that's certainly been my experience and my concern that um, unless you have a good way of measuring what a health service or a unit or a doctor or whatever or a hospital you know what the, the value and the quality of their service is how on earth can we expect a patient to decide and choose on which is the better service to get and it, it does become you know in practical reasons it becomes a difficult a difficult choice now it may be that you may say for example in in the um, device industry that patients can they often you know if you ask a patient how they want their prostatectomy done nine times out of ten if they're offered a robot they'll have it done because they think the robotic surgery is going to be better but really is robotic prostatectomy better than non-robotic prostatectomy and how do we get over to patients what the pros and cons of those are um i i think it's a, a difficult area to answer sorry thomas i can't be no no detail. i actually you know, I think that's a great way to i'm going to if thomas if you've got a minute uh we, i think it would be really helpful to hear from you but just so we can uh, stop at 10 25 but i think that was a great point actually Christabel. so um thomas over to you ah you're on news uh, Sorry, the classic mistake. I, I, uh, I, it's a very tricky question, I think, and and I think uh, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, when it comes to tying it to co-payment and sort of you can pay for the value that's important for you. Of course, there's a risk here uh, that 
while people who can pay for themselves can pay for those services that are important for them, but 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 not others, and that you you actually increase inequities in the in the system. So so, but so but of course it depends on on exactly what is what is meant here. But I but I think patient choice is clearly important, but that needs to be built into the system and 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 through you know measuring and comparing patient relevant outcomes. The, the patients get more information with uh, which they can make choice between providers or procedures or other things. So I think that's what we need to 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 encourage.